Scott Geyer uh, is our presenter. Uh, he is an HR service area manager with Oasis, a paycheck company, where he leads a team of HR professionals who support direct line supervisors with employee relation matters and consult with senior business leaders on the advancement of their strategic HR initiative, initiatives. Uh, so I am going to turn this over to Scott. So just bear with us for just one second. As Molly said, bear with us. Um, well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for taking some time this morning to uh, get together. Whoa, I didn't. Yeah. Um, we'll leave it there for now. Um, as uh, Molly mentioned, I'm, my name is Scott Geyer, and I work for Oasis, the paycheck company. And if that is not familiar, um, we started out as Merit Resources in 1989, um, and then in about 2014-15, we were purchased by Iowa Network Services, and then later that organization, we all changed our name to Arion, and then in 2018, Oasis purchased Arion, the PEO portion of the company, and then later that same year, Paychex purchased Oasis. <laughs> so. It's been an interesting um, <laughs> few years, we'll say. Uh, a lot's been going on, and that, um, but we, you know, the value of working with the PEO, just to give you a little bit of what I do, um, uh, <clears throat> is that we're able to work with clients to take some of the HR compliance and administration off your plate. And while we don't expect you to be an expert from trainings and like what we're doing in today's session, um, we're here to help and um, have the knowledge that you know, to provide you at a minimum to know where the common mistakes may be made and when you should seek out an HR professional or legal guidance. So um, that's what I do on a daily basis with consulting clients. Well, really my team does the consulting, but um, we're all involved in one way or another. So what we're talking about today is HR basics, top HR issues for small business. And that was the topic that was originally decided last year. And then when COVID um, entered the scene, we had talked about, um, you know, kind of changing up the topics and moving it into something more COVID related. Um, probably for two reasons, I was kind of on the fence about that. Um, that's all we've lived, breathed and spoken about for like the last four or five months. I I've, I've felt like I'd spoken enough, but um, I did also feel like that the topics we had already put together um, all have had an impact in some way or another by COVID-19 that we need to, to talk about and think about. So I kept this, the format and just added in some COVID impact um, slides and uh, pieces of information that will kind of lead us through the presentation today. Um, COVID-19 has touched all aspects of HR compliance in one way or another, and along with the impact to existing regulations, we now have added considerations um, with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and others, other government regulations that have come along the way. So this slide here is just saying I'm not an attorney. I'm, I'm not here to provide legal advice. Nothing new there. We see these all the time in presentations. And it didn't move. Let's see. There we go. Um, <clears throat> So as many of you on this training are well aware, I'm, assuming, I'm going to conclude because this is a small business um, geared appreciation that you're, you're probably representing small businesses in some form or fashion. So um, in a small business, many managers are wearing multiple hats. Uh, uh, that goes without saying. One of those many hats generally is human resources. So the workplace continues to change. It's becoming more diverse, more regulated, more unpredictable. Um, and then you add in COVID-19. Like I said, this is something that no one anticipated happening, and here we are um, with no signs of it going away in the near future. So um, the challenges and the risks facing employees today have never been greater due to all that. And for those that are a part of a small business, there's a constant balance being made between compliance and available resources. So um, that little scale on the screen there 
uh, we had in place with the with the original presentation, and I just slammed COVID-19 over the top of it because that's exactly what happened um, to paint the picture. So each of the HR topics presented include the high-level overview of each of those listed there, job descriptions, employee classifications, payment of overtime, handbook policies, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, and then employment at will. And depending on how time goes and with questions, we may not get to everything, but I'll make sure we hit the highlighted parts that I feel would be most beneficial. Um, and then you will learn, you know, kind of what you maybe need to do as far as take back to the office and decide what you need to do to take any action based on what, what you may learn from today's presentation. <clears throat> um, we'll pause after each of these topics and take questions. Um, as Molly mentioned, you can chat them into the chat and I will be able to see that. I think I'll be able to see them. Yes. Um, so we'll go that route. And then at the end, I'll open it up for just overall questions that anyone you may have. So at the end of this session um, today, you should be able to do the following. Describe the HR issue, its significance, and the impact it may have on the employee-employer relationship. Recognize any common pitfalls and uh, employers struggle with. And <clears throat> identify potential risk, risk, potential risk for violations and or litigation and create an action plan specific to your organization, which may help fix any current issues that you imagine or foresee. Um, based on what you're what we learned today and then along the way you'll learn how COVID-19 has impacted all, all the regulatory aspects uh, of the legal landscape and of employment and what you need to do to adapt to those changes again I think going into this everybody hoped thought however you want to describe it that this would be temporary um, or short short term and it's not been so um, we now need to continue to think about the future and how these different things impacts will um, continue to impact the legal landscape of HR. So job descriptions is our first to topic. Um, so while job, up, uh, an up-to-date job description clearly identifies a position's essential functions as well as the required knowledge, skills, and abilities needed to perform the job. Um, a job description should be the starting point of a hiring process. While job descriptions are not mandated by state or federal law, and we do get that question a lot, there's nothing telling you that you must have a job description on file. However, having an updated job description before hiring is beneficial uh, because it can assist in complying with the Americans with Disabilities Act by identifying those essential work-related duties of a position. It can aid in the exempt and non-exempt classification under Fair Labor Standards Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA, and applicable state wage and hour laws. Um, I'll talk a lot about, uh, reference a lot of uh, federal law throughout this presentation, not knowing where, I'm assuming most everybody on the, call, on the meeting here is from Iowa, but I don't want to assume that. So just keep in mind there are state laws that may impact some of these things as well. Um, job descriptions provide an accurate picture of the job to an applicant and assist the hiring manager and the supervisor in identifying the key skills and abilities the candidate must possess, which may help set goals and track performance later in the employee's life cycle. So there's a lot of uses for job descriptions if they are actually looked upon as a tool. Um, your job description should be a working document and updated as often as necessary to ensure that uh, they accurately reflect the work being performed in those positions. <clears throat> Um, so, what has in COVID-19 had as an impact on job descriptions? Well, um, I don't know if anybody, I submitted a blog post, and I, I assume it was posted or maybe it comes later, but there was an example in there that I, I used, and I'll just kind of pull that up as an example right now, um, or talk through that as an example. For 12 years, exempt manager Bill has gone into work at the office from Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and led his team of 12 customer service representatives. Today, that office is closed. His staff has been furloughed due to lack of work, and Bill works from home, handling incoming calls and responding to customers as necessary. So does Bob's job description need to be updated? Probably. <laughs> None of these things are easy answers. Now, if this is for a week, maybe not. If this is going to go on 
on be ongoing, which based on the fact that there was team members furloughed, I would say it's highly likely that this is not a temporary change and may go on for a while and therefore it may prompt a change in the job description. So any employees that have experienced a change in job duties because of the pandemic, consider a revised job description. Again, if this had gone on for two weeks, this, we might not even have this discussion. This has gone on now for what, five months, continuing probably likely through the end of the year, maybe longer. Um, if the job duties are going to remain changed, it's definitely worth going in and adjusting as necessary. Um, remote work likely would prompt an update to a job description. So like I said, our team, well, I, did, I mentioned it before the call, but our organization of 15,000 people were all moved home. Now we already had remote workers in place. So we have policies and things built out related to that. And it was, um, so it's easy to incorporate those. Um, if you didn't, and this is brand new, um, there may be some things you want to consider and in placing into a job description to make it very clear what the expectations are of working from, from a home environment. Um, include COVID-19 health and safety measures in the job description. So especially if you're using it as part of a recruiting effort, and primarily because candidates really want to know that they're going to be safe at work. Um, and this has become a very, very, very hot topic, obviously. And when people are looking for jobs, they want to, they want to know what the protocols are, are and what is in place to maintain safety while in the workplace. So then other pitfalls <clears throat> to kind of avoid in with a job description, using outdated job descriptions. So as I mentioned, um, it's important to keep them up to date. Um, outdated job descriptions may reduce your ability to hire the most qualified candidates for the job and to effectively conduct performance management tasks. So in addition, outdated job descriptions may not be as useful and perhaps harmful in any litigation. So one thing that is very commonly asked for if there's any sort of an employment practices claim is the employee's job description. And if the job description is a completely different um, description of what is actually being done by the employee, that's going to be problematic. So again, if you do have them, keeping in mind they're not mandatory, um, I highly encourage that you keep them up to date and as accurate and um, as possible. Um, another pitfall, using jargon like ninja or rock star in your job titles <laughs> can present a challenge. You don't see this very often, maybe not those two examples, but there are some pretty creative job titles out there, and that's fine internally, but when you go to post a job and, and use, you know, I don't think if I was looking for a job, I'm going to be searching a, a job board for a rock star. Um, although that does sound kind of cool. Um, so just keeping those things in mind, I mean, certainly internally, you can refer to them however you choose, but when you're posting externally, you might want to rethink that. Um, basically, the skills and experience on the person currently holding the position. So to help ensure that you're recruiting the right applicant for the job, it's important to first determine the minimum level education, experience, skills, et cetera, that you need to perform the job rather than basing the qualifications on the person that currently holds it. So if that person's been in the role, that you know for 15 years and you're going to replace you know it's hard to bring somebody in at that level likely um so you it needs to be what is what are the actual expectations for someone entering that role so taking action take action today by first making sure you have job descriptions Review them to make sure that all the required skills, job related experience and physical requirements for the position are listed and be sure to indicate essential functions. And this is again key with when you're working through a reasonable accommodation for an, um, an ADA claim. Uh, <clears throat> remove any job descriptions that are outdated and add new ones as needed. And the best thing to do is just dedicate someone to annually at minimum probably review job descriptions um, and make any updates necessary and just kind of put it as a part of your normal process that you do this on a periodic basis like i said minimum probably every year um, are there any questions related to job description it's a pretty simple concept really um i'm not anticipating a lot of whoops i'm not seeing the chat box scott there aren't any questions right now in the chat box okay. i know it's a little Good. tougher when you're sharing screen Got it. Thank you. Um, so employee classification is next. Um, the Fair Labor, <clears throat> well, let's, let's see here. 
Um, an HR issue that could potentially lead to violations, fines, and or lawsuits stems from the classification of employees as exempt or not exempt from the minimum wage and overtime provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act. The FLSA is a federal law originally enacted to protect workers, and that's the key piece here. It is in, it is in place to protect workers against unfair or employment practices and promote full employment. The law regulates federal standards for minimum wage, overtime, child labor, and record keeping. Employees are classified as either exempt or not exempt from some or all of the provisions of the FLSA. So non-exempt employees <clears throat> must receive at least minimum wage for the first 40 hours of work. They must receive time and a half, their regular rate of pay for all hours worked over 40 in a work week. And generally, manual laborers and blue collar workers are considered non-exempt employees. Be mindful though of any state laws, again, as I mentioned before, that may warrant additional consideration because for example, in California, overtime is calculated on any hours over eight in one day. This is one example. And there are others. Um, exempt employees, on the other hand, um, are not subject to the overtime and minimum wage protections of the FLSA. To be exempt, the employee must generally be paid on a salary basis, must receive a minimum salary, and that's currently $684 a week or $35,568 annually, as outlined in federal regulations and must meet the general duties test of one of the white collar exemptions of executive, administrative, professional, computer employee, or outside sales. An employee is considered to be paid on a salary basis if each pay period, the employee receives a predetermined amount of pay that is not subject to reduction because of variations in the quality or quantity of the work being performed. So the employer is ultimately responsible for supporting a consistent application of an exemption. Employers are encouraged to consult legal counsel if in doubt about the proper classification of a worker. Um, state laws may vary again there. Um, this, these questions come up to us quite often and um, so some of what we're going to talk about next will kind of call out some of the, the questions that we get from a daily basis or regular basis from our clients. So the impact of COVID-19 on classification, again, kind of going back to my example with Bob, you know, he now has no direct reports. He's working from home. He's answering the phone and doing other duties. Uh, should he be exempt? I mean, valid question, just because he always was and still has a title that maybe would lead you to believe he is. If he's not doing exempt related job duties currently, that may need to be reviewed. Um, the other Thing. Have you reduced any exempt employees? Hold on here. I'm on the right side. Um, have you reduced any exempt employee salaries to reduce costs? Um, I know a lot of businesses have gone around, gone through, and kind of done a salary reduction just to keep more people employed throughout the pandemic. And just be sure that none of those folks drop below the federal um, salary basis requirement of the 684 per week. Um, because again, that would be problematic. And again, some of these decisions were having to be made so quickly. It's just, I want to make sure <laughs> you want to make sure that nothing got missed in the, in the process. Um, is the employees, if you looked at, if this person was exempt due to the administrative exemption, is the employee's primary duty still the performance of office or non-manual work related to the management or general business operation? Maybe not. Um, if you were utilizing the exempt, Executive exemption, does the employee still customarily and regularly direct the work of at least two or more full-time employees or the equivalent? Again, going back to Bob, he, I don't believe, has any direct reports anymore. So the executive ex exemption, which if that's what was used, um, that by itself would lead me to believe he may be now should be non-exempt. Again, there are a lot of factors you need to look into to make these decisions. This is, these are not just quick, <laughs> quick uh, quick decision to be made. Um, other pitfalls, uh, classifying all salaried employees as exempt. And this is a common, I, I think, misconception. Um, hourly and salary methods of, are methods of payment, not classifications for employees. And there are salaried non-exempt roles that exist in the world. And I 
believe there is also an hourly exempt, although I have not personally witnessed that. It is an option. Um, so it can get even trickier, but um, asking an employee how they want to be classified, <laughs> definitely not your best choice. Um, and basing the exemption on this job title rather than the job duties and the method of payment um, is also a pitfall, could be a pitfall. So an HR manager does not automatically qualify for an executive exemption simply because of the position's title includes the word manager, as an example. Um, there are other uh, requirements that must be met for that role to be considered exempt. Um, the one we get fairly regularly from just, you know, we're working with um, organizations that have people in the quote, quote unquote, HR role that really come from all different, you know, skill levels, I guess you'd say. Some have no HR background whatsoever. And one question we do get at times is, well, this person's getting a lot of overtime, so we want to make them exempt. It's like, mm, <laughs> that's really not a good basis for making that decision. Um, and then just, you know, explaining the why, obviously, and then um, and there, it could be that it could work out with some job, just, you know, just some adjustments to the job description and the job duties, but um, at face value, that does not sound like a good idea. Um, so taking action today, oops, I don't know how to back up. Um, become familiar with the two types of classifications, exempt and non-exempt and the wage and hour requirements for each under the FLSA. And talk, contact legal counsel whenever a position's classification is in question. Um, a lot of them, even though you may make a decision, there's still, um, we have a tool that we can, we utilize and it still will um, kind of call out the level of risk. So a lot of them are not like for sure or for not, for or not, you know, definitely not. There's always a gray area. So you have to determine kind of how much risk you're willing to take. Um, review your classifications and make sure employees in the positions with similar job duties are classified the same. And where employees are covered both uh, under both federal and state law, they must be considered exempt under both. And always, whichever is most favorable to the employees, the one that's going to win out. So if the state law, which is typically what happens, is better for the employee, that's the, those are the rules you're going to need to follow. So I threw this in here, um, I just kind of as an extra slide. This question comes up, it seems like it's coming up a lot more now, and I'm not really sure that that's COVID related or what it is. It could be, um, people are looking for just people to step in and help with certain projects. But um, just a caution there, because this is one of the things that's really being monitored and they just changed some of the rules and made them a lot more strict. Um, as to how, what, what would actually classify as a 1099 employee or a contractor. So <clears throat> um, one thing that comes up, they want to, you know, like I said, use them for, you know, they have a project they want to work on. So when you start asking questions, then you find out that the employer is planning on providing them with the equipment to do the job, the computer, a cell phone. It's like, well, that already is a red flag. So there, you just, um, have to be very, very careful with that because the fines related to um, misclassifying a 1099 that should be an employee are pretty significant. And if it's deemed that it was intentionally um, misclassified, then it's even more than that, um, significantly more. So <clears throat> there are three basic things to work look at, and that's what's on the slide, behavioral control, financial control, and the relationship and where those where that control lands. Land. So, um, the general rule is that if, if an individual is an independent contractor, <clears throat> if the payer has the right to control or direct only the result of the work and not what will be done and how it will be done, then they could be an independent contractor. So you know you want this done, they, the independent contractor, figures out how it's going to get, how they're going to get there. Um, they a lot of times need to be able to make their own schedule, they need to have their own um, supplies, equipment, et cetera. Um, and so it, anyway, it's tricky. Just wanted to throw that out as a word of caution because it, it comes up a lot. And in many cases, the question, the ones we're being presented should, should be employees. 
<laughs> based on what we're being told. So questions about um, not exempt, exempt, independent contractors. Nothing thus far. Nothing? Okay. Um, so payment of overtime hours is next. Um, what is it? Well, the Fair Labor Standards Act requires that non-exempt employees receive at least the applicable minimum wage for all hours worked and time and a half the regular rate of pay for all hours worked over 40 in the work week. Um, they also require employees to retain complete and accurate records of time worked, including payment for overtime hours for at least three years. Now, there's no regulation as to how, you know, what format those records are kept in, but you do need to keep that um, detailed information for three years in case anything comes along that they need to go back and review. <clears throat> and again, state laws might have some more strict, strict rules. Um, paying non-exempt employees overtime. Non-exempt employees who work more than 40 hours in a work week must receive overtime rate pay at a rate at least one and a half times the employee's regular rate of pay for these hours. The regular rate must be at least minimum wage, be calculated for each work week, and include all remuneration received during the work week, with the exception of certain payments excluded by Federal Labor Standards Act. So what I mean there is most think of overtime as time and a half someone's rate. So if I get paid $10 an hour, my overtime rate is $15 an hour, not necessarily. Um, if you have received um, non-discretionary bonus payments in there, we have recently seen, and I'll talk about this in a minute, um, incentive pay related to COVID. And my team works with senior living communities. So there are those communities are putting incentive pay in place to unfortunately, and sent people to work with um, uh, and care for residents that are, are diagnosed with COVID-19. So those sort of additional payments have to be factored into what has been the overtime rate at the end of that week. Um, things that don't count, pay, pay for expenses. You know, if you get reimbursed for expenses, that doesn't factor in. Discretionary bonuses. So if you weren't expecting a bonus and somebody just walked up and handed it to you, <laughs> it's not tied to the job or the performance. That would not count toward the overtime calculation. Um, gifts uh, for special occasions, that sort of thing. So those are just some examples. All this is detailed out on the Department of Labor website. Um, so the impact of COVID-19 um, just the things that we're seeing happen. So fewer people handling more tasks is tending to cause employees to skip lunch or eat while working. And again, keeping in mind in the industry we're working with, this is very common. So they're short staffed, they're under a lot of stress, there's a lot going on, they're likely working through lunches. So it's up to the employer to make sure that if that happens, those hours are getting paid. Um, and which brings me to the second point, bullet point there, the automatic meal deductions, which a lot of timekeeping systems are set up to automatically deduct a meal for 30 minutes to, you know, quote unquote, make it easier, you know. <laughs> so, and it is, it can be, but it can also cause a big problem. So you be very careful with that because if people, if employees are actually not taking lunch and the timekeeping system is deducting it and they're not bringing it to your attention, one day they're going to get frustrated and then it's going to become a problem. So, just be, I'm not a proponent of it, um, but it does happen. And I, in some instances, it probably makes good sense, but just be very careful with that. Um, and then be sure any incentives that I mentioned that are being paid as it relates to COVID-19 are being blended into the overtime rate. And this is something that, you know, these are new pay codes being set up. So if I don't, you know, if you're doing your own in-house payroll or if you're having another service do it, um, just making sure that capturing those into these, um, since it would be new to, a, to the process. Um, other pitfall, pitfalls, averaging. So if you pay biweekly, averaging the hours work between two work weeks to avoid overtime pay, not an option. Um, the hours worked by week and the overtime within that week has to be captured. Excluding non-discretionary bonuses. Again, those are tied to performance in some way. Shoot, I got, I'm click happy. Um, you need to make sure to avoid that. Um, Providing comp time for non-exempt employees in lieu of overtime pay, not an option. Um, 
And then again, failing to retain and complete complete or accurate records for the three years is um, something to definitely keep in mind. <clears throat> so become familiar with each type of compensable time worked on the DUL site. Work with HR or legal to better understand the overtime calculation and payment rules and review the state overtime laws where applicable. Include all remuneration when calculating the regular rate of pay for purposes of determining the overtime rate. And remember to consider state laws. I'm keep mentioning that. <laughs> Questions related to overtime. Hopefully that all makes sense. I don't think the we'll coffee's kicked in yet. We're we're still good, Scott. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. I mean, a lot of this may be, you know, just reminders, so that's perfectly fine. Um, maybe when we get to the FFCRA, we'll have a different uh, conversation. But handbook policies. Um, what is a handbook? Now, I think we all know what a handbook is. Um, Handbooks are a means of communicating company policies and other key information to employees. They can also help establish basic ground rules for employee contact, in conduct, set the tone for employee-employer relations, and assist employers in consistent implementation of policies and practices. However, poorly written handbooks can be a liability. So you want to make sure that your employee handbooks includes an at-will at -will disclaimer includes a receipt page for the employee to sign, acknowledging that they've read and understand, avoid statements that may imply a contract or guarantee of employment, avoid language that results in claims of favoritism, discrimination, or unfair labor practice, and make sure if you have a handbook, and again, they're not regulated either. Um, there's nothing that says you have to have a handbook, but if you do, make sure the handbook mirrors actual company practices. And that can be a problem if you just don't regularly make updates or you've just somewhere along the line started doing things differently gradually and moved away from what the handbook says, whether it's related to attendance um, policies or uh, performance management. So just be careful with that. So COVID-19 policies you may want to add or update. So. As I mentioned before, many people went to work from remote locations in their home. So you may, if you didn't have a remote work policy, maybe time to dust one off, um, especially if you're considering keeping people at home um, beyond the pandemic. Um, intellectual property privacy policy. So we all now at home, and if, if we're working with highly confidential um, company property or um, data, you know, you want to set parameters to make everybody understand the importance of keeping that information either locked up or kept private in some way or another. I mean, we have people working at their kitchen tables, so keep those things in mind. Um, that's not exactly the most private place, probably. Um, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, currently set to expire at the end of the year. Who knows when that time comes, what may happen. Um, but because it's it's in effect for so long, it's not a bad idea to um, include a, a policy in a handbook. Health and safety protocols, like I mentioned before, these are coming, become very, very important. Um, and it's good to know um, and just go out, step out and say exactly what the standards are and then make sure you're following through with those. Um, and then requests for accommodations. EEOC has a very detailed FAQ regarding reasonable accommodations related to COVID-19. And uh, the one thing I think about a lot with this is, you know, it used to be, um, you know, we would get quests, requests for somebody to say, well, I, I need to work from home and, you know, decide, well, that's not really reasonable. Well, it's hard to say it's not reasonable now if you've just told the person to work from home for the last six months. So <laughs> um, those are just things that we're going to have to keep in mind going forward. A lot of these things are just forcing us to think differently. Um, pitfalls, um, not having an employee handbook. And again, you don't have to, but um, it's definitely advised and it does um, serve a lot of good purposes. Um, having a poorly written handbook is probably worse. Um, not having legal counsel review the policies to make sure that you're all, especially if you're operating in varying states, um, to make sure that you've captured any state laws that may pertain. And then having a handbook about the actual company practice of the policy differs from what is written. So again, if you're going to have it, make sure it's followed and make sure it's 
updated regularly, and it's uh, gone through a legal counsel review. And that's just saying the same thing again. So let's move to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, the FFCRA. Um, this requires certain employers to provide, and again, this has not been in effect since April, so hopefully this is not, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this is not the first time anyone's heard of this, but if you do discover that there are some things you maybe haven't been doing correctly, it's certainly time to go back and make reasonable um, corrections. So this requires certain employers to provide employees with paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave act or leave for specified reasons related to COVID-19, if unable to work or telework. And that's the key piece. If they are not able to work, are also not able to telework. Now, if they can just need to be at home, but could still do their job, which is what many of us are doing within our organization, that's, they don't need to be on a leave. Um, so it provides two weeks, up to 80 hours of paid sick leave at the employee's regular rate of pay when the employee is unable to work because the employee is quarantined. Sorry. Um, uh, under the advice of a healthcare provider and or experiencing symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis. <clears throat> That's one. Two weeks of paid sick leave at two thirds the employee's regular rate of pay because the employee is unable to work because of a bona fide need to care for an individual or an another individual subject to quarantine or to care for a child under age of 18 whose school or child care provider is closed or unavailable for reasons related to COVID-19, or the employee is experiencing a substantially similar condition as specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation with secretaries, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, up to an additional 10 weeks, and this is where um, it gets even more interesting. So up to an additional 10 weeks of paid expanded leave and medical leave at two thirds, the employee's regular rate of pay where an employee who has been employed for at least 30 calendar days, so that's a difference from what typical FMLA is, is unable to work due to a bona fide need to leave or care for a child whose school or child care provider is closed or unavailable. So if the school ended up and this person was able, unable to work or telework for basically 12 weeks, it could be paid at the two thirds rate. That's what we're saying here. Um, so who are the covered employers? The paid sick leave and expanded family and medical leave and uh, provisions of the FFCRA apply to certain public employers and private employers with fewer than 500 employees, which is really most small business. Um, small business with fewer than 50 may qualify for an exemption from the requirement to provide leave due to school closings or child care unavailability if the leave requirement would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. So you would have to justify that. Eligible employees are any employees of covered employers um, are eligible for two weeks of paid sick time for specified reasons related to COVID-19 and employees employed for at least 30 days are eligible for up to an additional 10 weeks of the paid, paid family leave that we mentioned um, just a second ago. So the duration for the reasons one, four, and six, which we can't see anymore, those were um, quarantined, bona fide need to care for an individual subject to quarantine, or the employee is experiencing a substantially similar condition as specified by the, by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, eligible for 80 hours of leave and a part-time employee is eligible for the number of hours of leave that the employee works on average over a two-week period. And there's a way of calculating that that's um, detailed out. Um, And then eligible um, for reason five, the full-time employee is eligible for up to 12 weeks of leave, two weeks of paid sick leave, followed up by 
10 weeks of paid expanded leave and the medical leave at 40 hours a week. Um, and the part-time employee is eligible for the average hours um, that they've worked. So same deal there. So the calculation um, is, is listed on this um, screen here. Employees taking leave are entitled to pay at either regular rate or the applicable minimum wage, whichever is higher up to $511 per day um, or 5,110 in the aggregate over a two week period. Um, employees taking leave for a level for leave reasons four or six are paid at two thirds. Again, $200 a day, 2,000 in the aggregate. And for number five, um, the same as above. So <clears throat> important to know that um, these, this is out there. This is in effect. Again, no one probably anticipated it would go on this long, although it's set to um, remain in effect through the end of the year, unless somehow along the way it becomes amended. Um, so you'll want to make sure that you properly document and account for all FFCRA approved leaves. And this has to be kept on file for four years. And so if you didn't start out being very careful about that, <laughs> again, thinking that this might not last forever, I would go back and make sure you're properly accounting for it because this is not a per instance, these leaves, if it's a one-time deal um, between now and the end of the year. So if I have already used my two weeks in March, I don't get another two weeks when school doesn't go back, if that's the case, come August. Um, it also, um, well, before I get to that. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of information out there. And this DO, on the DOL website, there's a robust, regularly updated FAQ that we, we review on a regular basis. Um, any questions that they get, they post with the, with the answers. It's really, really helpful information if you haven't been there to look at it. Um, and then ensure FFCRA notice is posted or provided electronically. So even if you haven't added the policy to your handbook, everyone should have posted um, the notice or electronically sent to any remote workers by 4-1-2020. Um, Again, if you haven't done that yet, I would recommend doing so. Um, and that's with, for any employer under 500 that um, has to comply with the FSCRA. And then the other piece of this is just to understand the intersection between the FMLA and the EFMLA. So like I mentioned, um, if they've used this extended leave for COVID related quarantine, let's say two weeks, um, they can't, can't do that same thing again. But if they've already used 12 weeks of, let's say from January through uh, March, they use 12 weeks of regular FMLA, they don't get another 12 weeks of the FFCRA leaves. So it's important that they understand the interaction of those and how and someone's keeping track and monitoring that. Um, make sure no one's overusing um, what's available to them. Uh, so before we go on from there, any questions related to the FFCRA? Or has anybody had any challenges or any good stories to tell <laughs> related to putting it into action? Nothing in the chat Quiet yet. Group. Quiet group. I think they're just soaking it all in. Maybe. Well, and I'm talking really fast. I was thinking I wasn't going to get through all this. So, uh, yeah, if I need to repeat anything, that's a valid question, too. So, um, uh, employment at will. Um, again, this isn't necessarily, I don't think anything related to COVID impacted this, but um, it's a common law doctrine generally allows the employee and or the employer to terminate the employment relationship at any time with or without cause notice with the exception of any statutory prohibition. Um, generally applies to only those employees who are not governed under a collective bargaining agreement. So basically, employment at will means I can quit for any reason if I'm an employee and you can terminate me for any reason as my employer. Sounds simple, right? <laughs> Not really. Um, many courts have found judicial exceptions to the employment at will doctrine in favor of employee challenges of wrongful discharge. So I highly recommend that you have a reason 
um, other than I'm going to exercise my at will rights and terminate your employment. Um, there are just so many other things to consider and just to, to be as safe as possible. Um, breach of implied or express contracts found to be created through written or oral promises of continued employment and dismissal for just cause only. An implied contract is a verbal or written statement often located in an employer's policies or handbook. Um, there's some public policy things that need that can come in play. Um, and the representation of good faith and fair dealing, which specifies that employers are required to act fairly and in good faith in the dealings with the employees. So um, our stance is that there needs to be this, anytime you're going to terminate an employee, they need to know why they're being terminated. And just saying it's an at-will termination is really not a valid reason. Um, it's really important to follow progressive discipline. Um, it definitely helps the case if anything does come to be down the road. Um, <clears throat> and progressive discipline is just a series of steps warning so that, again, there's no surprise when the employment comes to an end that the employee was made fully aware that this is going to happen. Well, I think we have a question here. When, um, so that is what that is. So let me see what this question is before I continue. Scott, did you want me to just read it or can you see it? I can see it actually, it popped up. So let's okay. see here. From Marianne, uh, since most small businesses do not have the resources to pay employees for all the additional time off, whether at two thirds or 100%, two weeks especially, additional 10 weeks, are there government subsidies to help to provide that? Um, not that I am aware of. Um, like I said, the only option that I know of if you're under 50 employees is that you can um, make a request that it's uh, financially not viable for you to do it. Um, and there's a process outlined in the, on the Department of Labor website to, to, to do that. But yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's not cheap to do this, pay people for being off. And, and then we're, you know, you're dealing with all these different aspects of COVID-19. It's like, if you have a fever, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's so hard to really know if that's really what the issue is, or if this is just, you know, and then you've got the people gaming the system. You've got, I mean, there's a lot to think about. Um, so Robert says, if an employee uses the 12 weeks of FMLA, can the employer also grant one or more weeks of FF? of FFCRA if they choose. Um, I don't, there's no reason you couldn't. Um, I would just be uh, consistent with doing that. So if you're going to offer that up to one person, just be prepared to offer it to everybody who may want to do the same thing. If, and again, I don't know how many you have that have already exhausted 12 weeks of FMLA, but um, consistency would be the key there. Um, and then Marianne, do employees need to use PTO first before paid? No, they do not. Um, FFCRA can be um, the first form of payment before PTO needs to be used. Um, I will say, though, with the two-thirds pay, you are able to supplement, which is kind of going against what your first question, but you are able to supplement the difference with PTO so that they're actually fully paid for the time that they can, that they, you know, for whatever PTO they have available to be used. That makes sense. All right, that's all we got so far. Um, so in summary, um, the workplace continues to change. It's becoming more diverse, more regulated, and more unpredictable. The changes and risks facing employers today have never been greater. Um, it's crucial for you to understand the applicable employment laws and to stay up to date on the latest developments to help you keep your organization in compliance and potentially avoid costly legal entanglements. And that's what, I mean, that's our goal. We want to um, do, we, our, our role is to do everything we can do to, re, to mitigate risk for our clients. So um, some of our answers are not well received, <laughs> I will say, but again, we're not here. You know, our, our role is just to keep, keep you out of trouble. I mean, we see too many things go south down the road because of something that wasn't done right on the front end. So, um, having visibility into a lot of different client situations and 
having learned from those on our end, we're able to pass that knowledge to clients and um, do what we can to keep them out of any kind of legal trouble. So, um, so any questions, it doesn't even have to be about what we talked about here. Um, if there's anything related, and I'm not going to guarantee I'll have the answer, but if I don't, I will absolutely let you email it to me and um, we'll, we'll get back to you with an answer. Like I said, I think without any doubt, we're going to be dealing with this for a while. Um, there's a whole lot of um, resources out there as far as return to work. So if you've still got people out on furlough or um, that have been laid off that you're now in a position to bring back, just things to think about um, and considerations to make, whether it's safety related or not. I mean, just it depends on how long they thought, um, you know, how long you anticipated them being out. If it was longer, then maybe different things to consider. Um, and our organization put together a ton of uh, resources for clients to use. Um, so, and again, if you, we still have a few minutes, so if you have questions that you think of, chat them in. Um, and then, or if you, I, mean, I had to throw this in there, if you're not a client of Oasis and just wants to learn more about what we do, certainly, let me know and I'll get you in touch with the right person. We're not, it's not a hard sell. It's just the strictly, I mean, and sometimes we, we work with clients or prospects that just aren't a good fit that, and we'll be right up front with that. Um, we're, uh, it just depends on the situation and the needs of each individual client, whether or not we can fulfill any of that. Um, but the HR aspects of it, and I think because over the last, well, quite a few years, and really it's come to, to be um, due to the fact that, you know, we have completely differing political sides, you know, in government that can't agree on anything. And because of that, it's forcing states and in some cases localities to make their own rules. So that's where this regulatory business has gotten so complex. And so there's so much to think about and remain on top of and be aware of. Um, especially if you're doing business in more than one state. Now, if you're, if you're in Iowa and everything you do is in Iowa, it's a little different and it's probably easier to keep track that way. But um, until we can get, you know, something like a, you know, an increase, in, I'll just throw this example, but an increase in national minimum wage, you're going to see cities, states make their own rules. Um, and it just, get, it's just gotten really challenging to keep track of. So, um, and that's, and then again, you throw in a pandemic and it, we have the CARES Act, the, you know, the FFCRA and the PPP loans and <laughs> all these other, other pieces of uh, elements of, um, of it. And it, it just adds that much more to it. So I, I, our heads were spinning at the front end. Um, it took a while. We were getting questions we didn't have answers to. I mean, flat out. So um, it was, it took a while, you know, to kind of get things put into order and um, get to where we are today. So I understand for any of you out there that are confused. And even if the question, I mean, if you don't have a question today, but it comes up tomorrow, my email's on the screen there, please send me an email, fguyer at oasispeo.com. I'm glad to help. Um, just mention that you were here and uh, they attend the, the webinar and you are interested, you have a question, glad to help. Um, and then I just added that picture on the last slide there. Um, it's a favorite quote of mine, at any given moment, you have the power to say, this is not how the story is going to end. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And I think Molly, you were going to kind of end, unless there are any final questions. Yeah, we'll give a, if you can answer questions, if there's any questions in the chat, feel free to ask them to Scott. And we'll also send his email and um, information out as well. So you can contact him that way. Thank you so much, Scott, for your time today. Um, thank you everybody yeah. for being on the call and um, listening in. Uh, our next top five um, events are just on our website at dsmpartnership.com slash events. So if you want to register for those, you can. Um, I think they're scheduled out till October. So feel free to register and uh, thank you so much.